Uh, the brain training industry, uh, this industry of selling programs that are intended to improve your cognitive skills on other things, is now big business. Uh, it's estimated from a 2015 market report that by 2020 it will be averaging about three and a half billion dollars a year in sales of these programs to consumers. This is now big business. Um, and it's uh, an industry that's growing quite rapidly. Um, it's promising that by practicing one thing, you can get much better at lots of other things. That's really the core, uh, core idea here, is that you can get better at the things you're not practicing. Now, that's a big claim. In fact, one proponent of a brain training program in a paper described it as the holy grail of training. Uh, it's the holy grail of training because if you can improve an underlying cognitive capacity, or what they would say an underlying brain capacity, but an underlying cognitive capacity that applies in a whole bunch of other settings, say working memory, by practicing it, anything that relies on that skill in principle could be improved. So that's the core promise here. But I think it helps actually to go back in history a little bit and look at some sorts of claims that map onto these in some ways that are interesting. This is a, a picture from way back in history. This is from 1869. And it's a drawing of the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. Now, this was a, a massive undertaking. And it was backbreaking work. So people were working 12 plus hours a day on the, on the rail. And they have extraordinary levels of pain from doing this, right? joint pain, back pain, as you'd expect from manual labor for that many hours. Um, but there weren't a whole lot of pain medications available at the time. It turns out that uh, while working on the Transcontinental Railroad, a large percentage of the people working on the railroad were Chinese immigrants, because it was one of the only occupations available at the time. And one of the remedies that was often promoted uh, for, um, for pain in that time was an ancient traditional medicine uh, using snake venom. So rubbing snake venom on the joints could lead to reduced pain for those, uh, for those joints. Um, and there's some evidence to that. Uh, in, the, in Europe at about the same time, uh, that was uh, the therapy that was commonly used was vipers, viper oil. Uh, in the US, in the, especially in the desert southwest, it was rattlesnake oil. Um, and it was, uh, the viper oil um, was potentially kind of effective. So uh, in the US, the biggest proponent of this sort of snake oil or snake venom as a therapy was Clark Stanley. And this is a picture of Clark Stanley from a pamphlet he distributed in the Chicago Fair in the 1890s. Um, he had a, a show where he would perform two different elements. One was on the history and the romance of being a cowboy. So the first half of this pamphlet was on all the great things about being a cowboy. And the second half of his show was about snake handling and the benefits of snake venom. Uh, he released these interesting advertisements um, that promoted cures for all sorts of things. So everything from frostbite to chill blains, I don't know what that is, to sore throats, to rheumatism, uh, to uh, pretty much any cure, any problem that you could list, he claimed that snake oil liniment, his product, would cure. And he would market these by doing these snake handling demos and then sell the product right there at the Chicago Fair and elsewhere. Now, what's appealing about this idea is that it's a magic bullet. Right? This simple thing, this one thing, could help you with all sorts of things, not just with your pain, but with your sore throats or your uh, other sorts of diseases. And this was in the, the heyday of the patent medicine era, the era when these sorts of uh, cures were not regulated in any form. Right? So um, this sort of magic bullet has a lot of appeal. Uh, and it's a similar sort of appeal. The idea that you can take one thing and have it improve all sorts of other things parallels what we see a lot in the brain training industry. So here are a few examples of claims that you get about brain training programs. Um, so Lumosity uh, state, used to, they don't do this anymore, uh, they stated that they help people do better in school, perform more effectively at work, and live a more productive life. That's pretty broad. Uh, CogMed, uh, said that they can help you academically, socially, and professionally. And remember, these are computer games. They're basic cognitive tasks turned into games that you do on your computer for some number of hours. Um, and they vary in how they do that. Some of them are more systematic than others. Some of them are really intensive practice. Others are much more simplistic games. Um, Posit Science, which is one of the biggest players in this industry that you probably have never heard of, um, uh, claim that it can enhance memory and cognition in the aged and strengthen critical life skills. Now, there have been a lot of 
uh, claims like these in the literature. If you go to any website of any of the brain training programs, you will see claims like these. If you listen to NPR, you can't help but hear advertisements for Lumosity. Right? That's still the case uh, now, and they, they continue to advertise on television. Um, if you read the New York Times, uh, you very likely will run across puff pieces promoting uh, brain training companies, uh, even in the last year or so. Uh, you'll see celebrity endorsements. So Tom Brady endorsed one of Posit's products last year, got major press releases for that. He, he also endorses a lot of other nonsense, but he endorsed that. Um, so this led a lot of people to become worried about this industry. And as a result of that, in 2014, um, a group of 70 plus scientists uh, from Stanford and the Max Planck Institute wrote a consensus statement. Uh, and their consensus on the brain training industry from the scientific community was essentially that to date, there is little evidence that playing brain games improves underlying broad cognitive abilities or that it enables one to better navigate a complex realm of everyday life. They also follow up by saying the promise of a magic bullet detracts from the best evidence to date, which is that, the cognitive, that cognitive health in old age reflects the long-term effects of healthy, engaged lifestyles. So in essence, they're saying there's not really evidence that doing these games is going to improve cognitive aging, that it's going to stave off dementia, that it's going to make you better in your daily life. Um, this was a, a highly promoted statement. A lot of people wrote uh, commentaries on this. Uh, it got a lot of coverage in the media. And less than three months later, another letter appeared. This one, another consensus statement uh, on a website called Cognitive Training Data from Brain Training Proponents. And they had more than 100 people sign a letter stating not just that this initial letter was wrong, although they did say there are some companies that do it badly. Um, they argued instead that the evidence shows that certain cognitive training regimens can significantly improve cognitive function, including in ways that generalize to everyday life. And they go on to say these studies show improvements that encompass a broad array of cognitive everyday activities, show gains that persist for a reasonable amount of time, uh, document positive changes in real life indices of cognitive health. So here we have two consensus statements. One consensus statement says, these things don't help in real life, they don't last long, and they don't generalize. Another says, these things help in real life, they last a long time, and they generalize. So we have a contradiction. Um, what do we do with this contradiction? Well, why, why is this? Why do we have two conflicting consensus statements? It could be for any number of reasons. It could be that each side is pointing to different evidence. Right? They're not looking at the same studies. It could be that they're looking at the same studies and interpreting them differently. It could be that they're just going with what their preconceived biases were and not looking at any of it. Um, we don't really know because prior to a review paper that a team of seven, seven of us worked on, there had never been a systematic review of the evidence in this literature. That cognitive training data website cited 132 articles as evidence supporting the claims of the brain training companies. So our goal uh, was, and this is uh, my colleagues who worked on this, Wally Boot, uh, Neil Charness, Liz Daimora, Sue Gathercole, Zach Cambrick, and Chris Chabri. Um, we worked on this paper for a couple of years. Um, and the goal of this paper was to review that evidence systematically, to take a look, starting with those 132 papers um, that they cited, on the assumption that if they were cited as the strongest evidence for brain training by brain training proponents, that this would be the evidence that would be most supportive of the claims. Uh, but we did a bit more than that. So this is the paper. It's, it's a 70,000 plus word monstrosity. So uh, you're welcome to skim it if you want, but it's a, lot of, it's a long paper uh, because we reviewed every single study of those 132, as well as every single study cited on the top 30 websites of brain training companies uh, as indicated by that market report I mentioned. So these were the top 30 biggest brain training companies. The vast majority of the citations, in addition to that list of 132, came from just five companies. Um, so Lumosity, uh, Cognifit, um, Cogmed, which is some of you, how many of you have heard of Cogmed? Okay, Cogmed, and it's one of the huge companies that works in the schools. So they're, they're targeting schools as their primary um, place for brain training. Uh, so Cogmed, Cognifit, Lumosity, Posit Science, and Scientific Learning Corporation, which makes Fast Forward. Some of you may have heard of that. Um, so the majority of those came from those companies. So we reviewed all of these. In total, it was about 400 papers that we went through. Um, and what I want to do is kind of go through the evidence. So 
132 papers, I want to start with those. Just because there were 132 papers doesn't mean that there were 132 unique bits of information there. In fact, not all 132 of those actually provide any evidence at all. So uh, we can start by looking at the kinds of papers they were. So of those, 21% were review articles. So no new evidence, just reviews of other evidence. Right? Um, many of those reviews were not actually of brain training. They were just reviews of basic neuroscience, neuroscience of plasticity, which is the buzzword that people in this industry use to explain brain training effects. Um, five of them measured learning only. So they can be what you think of as uh, looking at whether practicing Lumosity games makes you better at Lumosity games. That's not in dispute. So there's no question about that. That's not counting as working here. Because, of course, practice makes you better at things. Right? So if, if we had a problem with that, we'd be really worried. Um, nobody's disputing that part. Um, of these, 14 had no control group. So a critical question you have to ask yourself when you're looking at a brain training study or any sort of intervention is compared to what? Right? Let's say you get practice on something. You're going to get better at that. You might get better at something else, too. But you might get better at something else not because the practice did anything, but because you maybe take the test twice, which makes you get better at it. So you have to always have some sort of a baseline. Of those 132 papers, 14 reported, paper, reported things with no control group at all. So they just basically trained people on a task and measured how they did before and after on something else. Um, and six of them had no random assignment. So they had a control group, but they didn't randomly assign. That could be for any number of reasons. But in these cases, it was things like the one training group would be people suffering from major depression, and the other group would be college students. So you can't randomly assign people to get major depression. So they weren't true randomized controlled trials in that sense. Okay, so we're starting out with uh, a decent number of these paper, 832 papers not actually having interventions. Um, about 86 of them did. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's 86 unique interventions either. So let's take a look at these interventions. Um, of these interventions, we've got, again, numbers and percentage here, um, a passive control group. So when I said compared to what? Imagine you're, you're doing a brain training study. You're doing 50 hours of really boring working memory tasks. Get more and more difficult the more you practice them, the better you get at them. They're really intensive. You're focused on them, and you, can, you get better and better at them. And the control group is watching educational DVDs. That's an active control group. You're actually doing something. You're coming into the lab. You're doing something between the pre-training and the post-training. And a passive control group is one that does nothing. So it's a no-contact control group. Uh, basically, you test people before the study begins, and you test people after the study begins, but they don't do anything in between. They don't come into the lab and talk to the experimenter. They don't get any social contact. You're dealing with elderly people on these sorts of tasks. They're not getting any practice playing on a computer. They're not interacting socially with the experimenter. They're not doing anything. They're just getting tested before and after. So a control group that's passive means you've got a baseline that could differ in many, many ways from the intervention group. Many of them, uh, 49 here, have an active control group. That's good. Right? That means you're actually having people do something to equate for placebo effects. Right? So there's a reason why, if you're doing a drug inter intervention, for example, You'll have the treatment group that gets the drug that you're trying to test, and you'll have a placebo control group that, in principle, gets something that's identical in every respect except for the critical ingredient. That way, you can look to see whether people improve just because they think they should improve. They're taking something, they're involved in a study, they should get better. Right? So an active control group is an attempt to give some sort of a placebo control. In the brain training industry and in psychology in general, unlike medicine, you've got a real challenge for intervention studies, which is that you can't have a true placebo control. And the reason for that is people know what it is that they're doing. It's very hard to get 50 hours of working memory training without knowing that you're getting 50 hours of playing this game that's involving working memory. Right? If you're in a control group, say watching educational DVDs, you know exactly what it is that you're doing. And you're going to have expectations for whether or not the thing you're doing is going to help you. If I have you practice Tetris for 30 hours, everybody know Tetris, rotating shapes? Right. Imagine practicing Tetris for 30 hours, and your control group is watching educational DVDs. Which group is going to expect to do better if I give them a task where they have to rotate shapes? Tetris, right? They're going to have expectations for that. People watching educational DVDs, they're not going to have any expectations for improving on mental rotation. They might think they'll get better because they're being tested on it, but they're not going to have as strong an expectation. Equating those things in psychology is really hard. Um, 
a lot of these studies will have an active control group, but just because it's active doesn't mean it's a well-matched control group. Um, a really active control would be spending 30 hours being hit by wet noodles. Right, you're doing something, it's very active. It's not well-matched. So you have to ask that question, compared to what? Right, what's the difference between the control group and the intervention group? And is that control and intervention difference just the thing that you think is doing the training? So a lot of the active, active control groups, the most common ones are things like doing crossword puzzles, surfing the internet, watching educational DVDs. Very few are actually matched. Um, and again, just because there are 86 papers doesn't mean that there are 86 studies. Uh, 15 of the papers cited came from one study, the ACTIVE trial. This is the single largest intervention uh, in brain training industry. It was about 3,000 older adults. Um, and I'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute. It was actually a very well done study as these go. Um, but 15 of them were from, from this. Another 20 some odd papers were from a set of three interventions on people with schizophrenia. Um, so there were large studies that were reported across many, many papers. If you see a paper reported in the media as a new finding from the single largest brain training study ever conducted, they're reporting on the active trial, which is now more than 10 years old. Um, so they're reporting another outcome from that original study. So let me go over a few of the shortcomings of these, uh, this massive set of uh, papers we were looking at. These are just looking at those randomized controlled trials, the trials that have a control group and an intervention group. First, um, the vast majority of them have very small samples. Um, if you look at the original studies from Scientific Learning Corporation, they weren't randomized controlled trials at all. They were individual studies with one or two or three participants uh, in a case study. That doesn't really tell you much uh, in, in terms of the effectiveness of an intervention. Um, for CogMed, the one that's marketed to schools the most, the average sample size in those studies is 10, uh, so 10 participants. Uh, not big if you really want to draw strong causal inferences from the effectiveness of an intervention. There are a few bigger ones since then. Um, many of them that are cited by the brain training companies are not of the sorts of, uh, they're of special populations. So they might be of people with brain damage. They might be people with schizophrenia. They might be elderly adults with early onset dementia. Um, many, many of the studies that are cited are not of normal cognitive aging or of 22-year-old college students, yet most of the marketing doesn't say anything about that. It talks about helping you in your daily work in school and life. Um, not that many of the studies actually study your average person to the extent that there is an average person. They don't really study that. Almost all have inadequate control groups. Almost all. There are very few studies that come close to matching the intervention group to a control group keeping everything except for the critical element the same. Um, there's some that do better than others. The, actually, the video game training industry is a bit better than the brain training industry in this sense, that they'll have at least some matched control conditions that also involve playing active games for a long time. And they just vary the type of game. That's closer than most. The vast majority of the brain training studies have control groups that have no matching at all. They're just doing something. So it controls for things like experience, spending time, with the experimenter in between, but not on the things that you're actually training. This is a big problem. Um, this is one that I've been harping on as a research methods person. There's massive under-reporting of outcome measures here. So if you imagine you're doing a 50-hour training study, right, um, you're not going to only measure one cognitive task as your outcome measure, right, because what a huge waste of resources. You're bringing in say, 30 people, training them for 50 hours in the lab, you're going to want to measure a lot of things. That's wise. It's a good use of resources. These studies cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to do. If you see a paper with 50 hours of training reporting one or two or three outcome measures and not mentioning that there were 50 or 100 others, they're under-reporting. That's the norm in this literature. And the problem with that is if you then take those same study, that same intervention, and report different outcome measures across different papers, there's no way to evaluate how effective those interventions were. If you do 100 outcome measures, right, and one of them you report in a paper as this improved significantly, p less than 0.05, well, we expect, on average, just by chance, five of them to improve differentially. Right? If you're only reporting the ones that succeed and you're spreading those across five papers, 
we have no idea what the actual effect is here. It might be zero. And there is pretty substantial publication bias in this literature. Things that don't work don't get published. So there's selective reporting of outcomes. This is a literature in reviewing it that was kind of disturbing to do. We found at least five cases of pretty clear scientific misconduct. Things like duplicate publication of data, uh, under-reporting of measures that didn't work. Um, there, there are lots of issues in any big literature. When you look at it in this level of depth, you'll, you'll find some problems like that. But selective reporting is, is a biggie. Um, another fun one is missing critical tests. If you want to show that the training group improved more than the control group. Right? So the intervention you did, you did this brain training for 50 hours and it improved more than the control group that did some other task. You have to test whether the improvements differed in those two groups. What you often find is this group improved significantly, this group did not, therefore they're different. But a difference in significance and whether or not something significant is not a significant difference. You could have a difference that just passed the threshold here, but was almost identical and just slightly less in the control group. The groups don't differ at all, but one's significant and one's not. This is a really common problem that is, happens in this literature, that people underreport the critical tests. More often than not, if you look more carefully, they wouldn't have been significant. So that's why they didn't get reported. Um, and there often are opaque publishing practices that people don't actually report all of the measures, all of the tasks that they used. In a number of cases, through other sort of forensic evidence from these papers, we could determine that a single intervention was reported across multiple papers with no mention that it was the same intervention. Which means that if you're trying to do a meta-analysis or a synthesis where you're estimating the size of the effect across all of these studies, you might, if you just looked at the literature, treat those as independent evidence. Hey, look, three studies showing benefits for this brain training intervention. But it's actually one study which means that it might have had to do with some flukes of the random assignment or flukes of the participants you happened to get in that study, especially if it was small. Or it might have to do with the fact that the other 50 measures were never reported and the only ones that ended up in press were the ones that they found significant. Um, so what are the results that we find from this systematic review? Um, the first, and this is by far the most consistent and overpowering effect that you see, is that practicing anything makes you better at that thing. Not surprising. You get learning when you do these tasks over and over again. You also, to some extent, get narrow transfer. By narrow transfer, I mean if you practice one working memory task, you might get better at that same task with slightly different materials or at very closely related tasks. Um, that's probably the biggest finding from the active trial. Um, the active trial was nearly 3,000 older adults um, three training groups and a no-contact control group. So you had one group that got a speed of processing training task, one group that got a memory task, and one got, group that got a reasoning task. They each did those for 10 hours. They also got, in addition to that, sort of self-efficacy scaffolding, teaching them how to use these things that they were learning outside of the task. Um, so it's 10 hours of training. Uh, the outcomes were tested immediately and after years, after one, three, five, ten. We're way past 10 now. Um, and it was actually well documented. So there was an initial methods paper that listed what the primary outcome measures were. It was pre-registered. Well, I, it was post-registered because it was on, uh, on uh, clinicaltrials.gov, but after the initial wave had been done. But they did a very good job of documenting what they were going to do, and they followed through on what they've done. There are many, many other papers. There are more than 50 papers now based on this one trial. Um, that were not part of that original plan. They're secondary measures that haven't been, uh, that it wasn't designed to do, that people have looked at. Um, they are many, many secondary measures. Um, in fact, there was a paper just last year on uh, decreases in dementia um, claimed from this original trial. The key result, and this is probably the most consistent result from across all of these studies, across the main outcome papers, was that training was very narrow. If you practiced a speed of processing task in which you were pressing buttons on a computer while searching for things, uh, doing an attention task, you get better at speeded response time tasks like that. And again, these are all older adults, many of whom at the time had not used computers very much. So if you practice using a computer for 10 hours, you get better at responding quickly using a computer. Right? If you practice memory tasks, you get better on very closely related memory tasks, but you don't get better at speeded processing. If you practice speed of processing, you don't get better at memory. If you practice reasoning, you maybe get a little bit better at reasoning, not that much. You don't get any benefits for speed of processing or for memory. So transfer 
was quite narrow. Um, so what else can we learn from the systematic review? Um, there is essentially no evidence for objective improvements on real world measures of behavior, real world outcomes. There are not strong evidence that these brain training programs have any benefits whatsoever for your professional, social, or school life. They don't stave off dementia. They don't prevent cognitive aging. There's no evidence in this literature. In fact, very few of these tasks actually measure real world outcomes at all. They're measuring your performance on the brain training tasks and on other cognitive and neuropsychological test batteries. So they're not actually studying the things that they're marketing. Um, so there's very little evidence for objective real world improvements. Um, there's very little evidence that it staves off the normal effects of cognitive aging, which of course is the hope of the brain training industry. And it's, it's the source of a lot of their targeted marketing. Um, and there's a, not a lot of evidence for accurate marketing here. So we didn't systematically review the marketing. That wasn't within the purview of what we were doing in this paper. Um, this paper was supposed to be reviewing the evidence uh, as best we could to see whether there was any evidence for broad transfer of these cognitive training tasks to real world performance. Um, we looked at some of the marketing, but not a lot of it. Uh, in part because we're not experts on, on the rules of advertising. There's a standard in the advertising literature called puffery. You're allowed to do a little bit of exaggeration, right? So uh, Coca-Cola has polar bears drinking Coca-Cola. Nobody thinks that they're saying, yes, polar bears actually prefer Coke to Pepsi, right? Th that's puffery. It doesn't really make a definitive factual claim. That said, there have been a lot of factual claims that have come under investigation. So in the few years uh, while we were working on this paper, uh, you might have heard that Lumosity was charged by the FTC for deceptive advertising. Uh, they were fined $50 million for deceptive advertising, which was reduced to $2 million due to financial hardship. Um, I'm not quite sure how that worked, given that they're now back on television advertising massively. Um, but still, they were a substantial fine for deceptive advertising in all of their testimonials and their websites. Um, there were several other cases of uh, brain training programs being investigated and found guilty of deceptive advertising. Uh, the FTC applied a pretty reasonable standard, which is that if you want to make claims of benefits uh, in real world, you have to have a randomized controlled trial with a decent sample size um, and a decent control. Uh, many of the claims didn't hold up to that. I don't know whether those investigations have continued over the last year or so. Uh, they were building up steam over the few years before that. Um, before I want to, I want to give one example of marketing uh, that I think is kind of an interesting case. Um, this is uh, from Posit Science. Posit Science mostly markets via uh, insurance agencies. So for a while, they were marketing through AARP. Um, they still are doing some direct marketing now. Um, but for a while, they had a partnership with AAA. That's since been dropped. I'm not exactly sure why. The AARP relationship has since been dropped. Um, but they marketed extensively through uh, insurance agencies as a way of reaching their potential target audience. Um, CogMed. Uh, markets directly to schools and school boards. They'll actually go into school administrators and try and convince them to pay for their software to bring it into the schools as an alternative or a supplement to classroom teaching. Um, so that's, those are two different approaches. Um, Posit also markets directly to therapists in the hope that they'll promote it to their clients, uh, so getting the trusted advertiser for them. This is a, a website post um, from one of Posit's programs called DriveSharp. Uh, all of what Posit Science has done is they've licensed the speed of processing task that was used in the active trial. Right? So that it's a, an attention task where you're doing something right where you're looking and you're having to detect objects that are appearing at different distances from fixation. It's called the UFOV task. Um, it's an acronym. They licensed that task. Uh, and many of their claims on their websites are based on the results of the active trial, not from their own interventions. Um, as I mentioned, the active trial, in addition to having these training tasks, also had self-efficacy training and other sorts of things that are not part of their program. So it's not actually justified to make claims of benefits of the training alone, which is all they provide. But in this case, DriveSharp is a targeted version that's intended to improve driving among the elderly. And there are several claims that I think are really interesting to look at as an example of the kinds of marketing that happens in this industry. So here are three claims. Training allows drivers to react faster, providing an additional 22 feet of stopping distance at 55 miles an hour. Now, that's actually huge. 
if that's true, that is a huge real world transfer, objectively measured, right, that has big consequences. 22 feet at that speed is the difference between a fender bender or an avoided accident and a fatal one. Right? That's big. Another one that training reduces dri dangerous driving maneuvers by 36%. And the last one is training reduces at fault crashes by 50%. Those all sound great. Wow, okay, let's run out and do our 10 hours of speed of processing training. All of these come from published papers. I want to go through what these actual, the actual evidence is that they're citing. Um, so the first of these, training allows drivers to react faster, providing an additional 12, 22 feet of stopping distance at 55 miles an hour. This comes from a paper in Human Factors um, from 2003 that's actually before posit science existed. Uh, so it's earlier evidence. They're citing the task that was used in training. Um, and this was actually a pretty good paper. It was comparing uh, driving performance in a simulator uh, and looking at results and improved driving performance. Um, what's interesting is that there was no measure of stopping distance in this paper at all. So what are they measuring? You're doing speed of processing training, again, older adults, doing speed of processing training with choice response times. So you're pressing buttons on a computer keyboard, and you're getting faster at that. Right? People improve at that. Um, they then take people and put them in a car simulator with buttons on the keyboard. And their task is to respond as quickly as possible whenever they see something change in the environment. So they're doing a speeded detection task after having practiced doing a speeded detection sort of task. And what you find is that when they do that, um, you get uh, a 277 millisecond improvement after having practiced on a computer as an older adult at doing another computer task as an older adult. So the general discussion of the paper, there's nothing in the results section about this at all. The general discussion says the speed of processing trained group improved on the choice reaction time task in the simulator. So they basically are doing a computer task but just in the simulator. Um, for a vehicle moving at 55 miles an hour, this improvement of 277 milliseconds translates into a stopping distance of 22 feet shorter. So basically they said, hey, look, they're faster on this computer response time task. If we convert that to driving speed, here's what that would mean. That's a pretty big jump. In fact, there's pretty good evidence that choice response time does not predict stopping time for older adults because they compensate. Um, for slowed responses in driving. They keep bigger headway distances. So if anything, this doesn't actually predict anything about driving, but there's no measure of driving at all. Um, let's, uh, let's look at this next one. Training reduces dangerous driving maneuvers by 36%. Um, this, is a, this is an interesting one. This came from, uh, look familiar, same paper. Um, they actually did something really cool in this. Um, which is they had, this is one of the only studies, and it, it's not a great study, but it was, I give them a tremendous amount of credit because what they did was really hard. They got people actually on the road driving. And they measured with people in the back seat, coding over 400 different behaviors right, uh, before and after training. Um, and they're coding those 400 behaviors, uh, and you get this big table of all of the outcome measures that you find. And what you find is that the speed of processing training relative to a simulator training group um, improved performance on one measure out of these 405 that they compiled in a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, the one measure was the Raiders judgments of whether or not they had made a dangerous turn. So it was the only subjective measure. It also was a fairly small reduction from an average of one dangerous maneuver to 0.69 or 0.65 dangerous maneuvers. So what you've got here is that the vast majority of participants made no dangerous maneuvers. A handful made a bunch. And by the time you get to 18 months, they had attrition of more than 30% in their study, which meant that if the bad drivers died or dropped out, then you no longer have any effect. OK, last one. Training reduces at-fault crashes by 50%. Um, now, this is, a, again, a really remarkable claim. It was based on gathering data from the DMV about accident records and accident rates from multiple states with a decent-sized sample of the people who had been in the active trial. So objective measured evidence of performance, which is pretty cool. Um, there's an alternative headline you could give here, which is that speed training more than doubles your risk of a not-at-fault accident. 
This is cherry picked. You have total crashes that are essentially identical between the speed training group and the control group. No difference in the total number of crashes. But if you subdivide it into what are called at fault and not at fault crashes, the at fault crashes went down and the not at fault crashes went up. Right? So if you split the data enough ways, you're going to find some that are bigger than average and some that are lower than average. That's what they found here. Basically, you're noise mining. There's not really anything going on here. What you really care about is total crashes, not at fault crashes, because defining at fault is always hard. Right? So in many states, the person at fault is always the one who hits the other car from behind. So if you're an older driver and you stop in the middle of an intersection at a green light and somebody runs into you, the person who runs into you is at fault, even though it was actually your fault. So we don't know anything about these accidents and how at fault they were. But uh, I, want, I highlighted these three because I raised all three of these with Posit Science seven years ago. Uh, as of two days ago, it's still on their website. They know that these claims are wrong. They know that they're not justified. They're still on the website. Um, so they're using these things in marketing. When we pointed these out, we actually wrote about each of these in the paper. This is the only marketing examples we used because they were really concrete claims of real world benefits. Um, Ed Young, a great science writer, wrote a story about this. And in it, he quoted the CEO of Posit, um, who said, the authors are moral monsters for making the argument, that argument, and you can quote me on that. Um, this is a public health issue. Senior driving is a problem, which is important in a population. A person in health sciences who argue that we shouldn't reduce heart attacks because heart attacks are rare would be rightfully drummed out of the profession. What we pointed out was that total crashes, based on their own data, uh, would be reduced by, in the speed of processing group relative to the control group by one crash every 200 some odd years. Right? There's no effect there. Um, he called us moral monsters, which I really liked, uh, so we made those. Um, so let me, uh, let me briefly wrap up here by pointing out some interesting parallels, and then I want to come back to Clark Stanley. Um, so let's compare snake oil and brain training. Um, so snake oil, the claim is that it cures pains and poisons and most health problems. Brain training, you've got everything from improved vision and memory and IQ to work school to driving to staving off ADHD to Alzheimer's. There have actually been claims that it will help with schizophrenia. Um, the evidence is for snake oil is entirely anecdotes and case reports. Um, for brain training, it's learning of the trained tasks, but we find very limited evidence for transfer. The critical ingredient uh, in snake oil is venom. Uh, in brain training, it's practice or training. And the mechanism uh, for snake oil was never specified at that era. Um, for brain training, it's neuroplasticity. The same guy who called us moral monsters also said that we were old fuddy-duddy, old school psychologists is what he put it, because we were focusing on the fact that for 100 years of studies of learning, what the consistent finding is, is narrow transfer of training. You get better at the things you practice. You don't generally get better at other stuff. But he argued that we were old school psychologists who weren't aware of the magic of neuroplasticity. To my knowledge, there's nothing in the literature on neuroplasticity that speaks to broad transfer of cognitive abilities from one task to another task. It's just not the same level of analysis. And it's not clear that you can ever link the two in this way. Um, and finally, the marketing is really similar. Testimonials, founder stories, cultural appropriation in the case of snake oil, and testimonials and founder stories founded by neuroscientists, inspired by neuroscience, and truthiness in some of the claims. Now, there are potentially real benefits of snake oil. Um, placebo effects can be great. They can help. If you can motivate yourself to do better and you end up doing better, that's a great outcome. Right? If you think that taking some task is going to make you, or doing some task is going to make you better on performing, you might go in more confident, you might actually do better. That's great. Um, the ingredients themselves might have some benefits. Snake venom might actually be functional in reducing pain. We know that some toxins do help for a lot of things. Uh, botulism toxin can actually prevent some spa muscle spasms. There are benefits to toxins in some cases. Um, the mechanism for brain training is, and for snake oil is potentially plausible, but largely untested. The same is true in the brain training industry. What we really need are well-designed studies with appropriate control groups. We don't know that it doesn't work. What we do know is that there's not evidence for it yet. Um, more broadly, if you enjoy doing it, go for it. But just don't expect other benefits. If you like playing Lumosity, it doesn't hurt anything. 
do it. If you think it's going to stave off cognitive aging and you're spending hours and hours playing a game instead of going out and walking, there's an opportunity cost there. So let me just quickly return to Clark Stanley. Stanley uh, was this big promoter of snake oil, and it wasn't until about 1906 when the uh, early precursors of the FDA in the United States began looking into these patent medicines. And it turns out that Clark Stanley was investigated and fined $20, which at the time was pretty big, um, and his business was shut down. Why? Well, it wasn't for deceptive marketing, so it was for deceptive marketing specifically, it wasn't so much that the product was ineffective, it was that it didn't contain snake venom. <laughs> so it didn't include the critical ingredient that he was saying made so much of a difference. Um, and I think that's a, a good lesson to learn here, is that there's not necessarily anything wrong with snake venom and snake oil, but if you want to claim that it's effective, you actually have to have the right ingredient there, and you have to compare it to the right control groups in order to show that it's got some benefits. So I'm, what I'm hoping the lesson here is that don't just count up the number of studies that have been done. Don't rely on statements that, hey, look, there's hundreds of papers supporting this. You actually have to look at them more critically. So you have to count them the way a moral monster would. So now I'll stop there. <laughs> you along. Hmm? Okay, a couple minutes for questions? Yeah. So I've, I've been looking forward to your talk all day. Uh, so it's fantastic. Um, but I, I do, I do want to ask you a, que uh, a meta question to you because yeah. I, I don't. Your analysis is perfect. Um, you know, Barbara said, "Oh well, it's good to know that the brain changes with training." Unfortunately, that is the worst thing we ever told people because it led to the cult of neuroplasticity, which I've written about. I mean, it's you can't. It's a disaster, that term, right? And um, unfortunately, it seems to me that there's all these pseudo papers, <laughs> CEOs talking about plasticity, the flaws in the analyses are just a echo of what's happening in psychology and neuroscience in the serious literature. So all they're really doing is parasitizing on the hyperbole that we're responsible for, right? I mean, we heard about neuro myths in the last talk. The biggest neuro myth is that neuro helps anything, right, outside of neuroscience itself, right? So do you have a comment as to, we've created this problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm more aligned with that statement. I, I, I consider myself a dinosaur in that I really don't, I'm, I'm a psychology, I, cognitive psychologist. I don't refer to myself as a neuroscientist in any way. I don't do anything related to neuroscience. I, I don't most of the time care that much about neuroscience. Um, I think there are cases when neuroscience can be really informative within cognitive psychology. Um, and those are, the, those are cases where, for example, you couldn't get a behavioral measure to tell you what you want to know. Right? And you might be able to dissociate behavioral, measure, behavioral mechanisms using a neuroimaging measure. Say, for example, a task in which you asking somebody to report on their knowledge would interfere with... Yeah, but what that's they within neuroscience. Within I have neuroscience. no problem with psychology right. and neuroscience talking I think to there, each other. I'm talking about outside. I, I think there has been a real danger here. Um, partly it's, it's so appealing, and it, it has been so appealing, to talk about neuroscience. That, that's why I think you get neuro attached to the beginning of everything. Um, so you now have neurogenomics and neuropolitical science. Um, partly it makes it seem like it's more scientific. In, in some cases it is, but in other cases it's just cognitive psychology being relabeled as neuroscience. Um, and it can, it can actually cause misunderstandings and misinterpretations. I think these companies, I, you know, whether or not they're true believers, whether or not they're using this entirely as a marketing ploy, some of them are, probably some of them aren't. Um, some of them, I think, really believe that the evidence that the brain changes in response to training is evidence that will generalize to other sorts of things. I, I think there's actually, and you could make a case Right, a legitimate case for a mechanism that might work that way. Right, so you might, Posit Science, for example, I think is more grounded than many of these other companies, even though I pick on, here, pick on them here. So their logic is that what you really want to do is train basic sensory processes, right? train basic acoustic perception, uh, train basic vision, because you need that input in order to get everything that's involved in what you do in the daily life. So if you can improve your efficiency at taking in information, then you're going to be able to improve anything that uses information. Um, there's kind of an, an intuitive logic 
to that. Um, I'm not sure that I buy the mechanism, but there's an intuitive logic to it that relies on that sort of idea that the brain changes. I, I do think there's a danger in constantly saying, hey, look, it's all about the brain. The question I always ask my students is, would we learn anything more if you said it happened in the spleen? Right? And more often than not, you're not learning anything more than that. Right? So you're saying, hey, look, this brain area lights up. Well, I haven't really explained anything by saying that that brain area lights up. Um, if it had turned out to have been a different brain area, you might have made a different story, but it wasn't necessarily explaining it, and exactly the reasons you laid out so clearly earlier. Um, so I, I think there is a danger in, in the appeal to neuroplasticity because people view it as something unobservable, right? something that's different from how people act, how people behave, uh, and it lends it more credibility in a sense because it's unobservable in that way. And I think that's why the brain images have so much power is that they're showing you something you can't see about yourself. Um, so I, I think there is a danger in appealing to it when there's not actually the neuroscience grounding of this. Um, this whole industry called brain training, there aren't any studies in this industry in which you're actually doing something like training the brain. You're not even doing something at the level of training using dopamine responses, right? You're not doing brain training. You're doing cognitive training. It's the stuff we've known about for decades it's not, or centuries. It's not really anything new there, but it's got a new label that's really appealing. One more. Okay. I'm Chaz Firestone from Johns Hopkins Psychological and Brain Sciences. So um, there's obviously a lot riding on the question of whether brain training programs work, like whether we should do these things ourselves, whether we should recommend them to children or older adults. Um, but I wanted to ask about maybe like a more foundational question in cognitive science that I think you've alluded to in some of your work on this. So uh, I think you've mentioned in some work that one of the first tests of brain training was by Edward Thorndike, who found that if you train people to estimate the areas of rectangles, they don't get better at the areas of triangles and circles. And he concluded on that basis that our minds must be these extremely specialized systems um, with very, very small parts. And that connects up with a bunch of other big picture <coughs> debates in cognitive science. And I was wondering just whether you agree with Thorndike about that that that's another question at stake here, yeah. not just what we should do, but also how we should think about how the mind works. Should we think of it as like one general purpose system that we can train, or should we think of it as being this tiny collection of parts, and that's why we might not get transfer? Yeah, so the question is how extreme is the modularity here, right? And um, I, I should point out that all of the brain training proponents also argue for forms of modularity. So nobody's arguing that it's a general purpose learning mechanism that works for everything. Right? So. Uh, one company will train working memory performance, and they argue that that's the right way to do it, that that's going to enhance this wide range of behaviors that use working memory. But they would be perfectly happy saying that's not going to improve other sorts of things that aren't related to working memory. Same thing with the speed of processing training. The argument is that it's helping things that rely on speed of processing, but it's not helping intelligence, for example. There, nobody's making that claim. There have been claims that working memory training improves intelligence, but there are also claims that those are basically measuring similar sorts of things. Um, I don't know, and I think the real challenge for the brain training literature is defining what counts as near and what counts as far transfer. Right? So the case that Thorndike describes of training them to learn the area of a square and generalizing to the area of a circle is about as narrow as you can get and not find transfer. Um, we've done studies where we train people for 10 hours on a change detection task with photographs of objects, and we don't find transfer to other change detection tasks using just slightly different materials, right? novel shapes. Um, we don't get transferred to other change detection tasks like the Flickr task. What you generally find in these sorts of tasks is people are really good at learning in context. So if you give people a ton of practice on something, they're going to learn strategies that work for those materials. Right? But they might not generalize the strategies they learn to other materials. Right? They, they've learned very narrowly. We know this from the long-term memory literature, or the digit span literature, that if you practice learning digit span, you can get better and better and better at it. You chunk more and more things together, but it doesn't necessarily improve your memory for anything else. Right? So there's a lot of evidence for narrow transfer going back that 100 years. But there's never really been a compelling definition of what counts as near and what counts as far. So I kind of glossed over that in this, in this context. I think it's kind of one of those we know it when we see it sort of distinctions. There's a, or do we have time, or do we show you? How do you want to do? Do you want to? Told the, but we can still get the okay, question. Okay, why don't we get the Yeah. So, so another major industry in Illinois is, is exercise. So what's, yeah. your take on, what's your take on the efficacy of exercise? Yeah. 
So uh, in, in this review, we only focused on the cognitive brain training program. So we deliberately avoided, there are lots of other in, in literatures that deal with improving performance. So there's mindfulness training, there's exercise training, there's, there, there's a wide range of those. My understanding from a surface glance at some of those literatures is that they're very similar to this one. Um, exercise training actually does a bit better, uh, at least in some of the cases. So some of the earlier studies did something that the later ones haven't done quite as well, but the initial studies did training where they had really well-matched control groups. So imagine an intervention study for fitness training on cognition in the brain, right? and you have older adults, mostly sedentary, and you come in and you have them do one of two training regimens. Either they do a stretching and toning regimen, kind of like Tai Chi and weights, um, or they walk around the mall three times a week for 45 minutes at a time at a good brisk pace. Right? If you ask people, um, not knowing what, what the outcomes are, if you ask people, how much do you think you would improve your cognition by doing this? Right? People expect the stretching and toning group to improve more on cognition. Um, in reality, the aerobic fitness group improves more. So there you have a case in which you've kind of controlled for the placebo effect because you've got different expectations. And the expectations don't match the outcome or the theoretical prediction. There's also better grounding for the idea that exercise is going to lead to more general improvements in that there's a sense in which if you increase your aerobic fitness, you're increasing the efficiency of getting oxygen to the brain, which should help the brain. Um, you're not training a specific skill in the same way. So I think there's better grounding at, at pretty much all levels of analysis for that claim than there is for the cognitive training transfer claim. Yeah, but we didn't look at it in detail because there, there have been several other reviews of that literature.